So, I so you, and you, you ladies, you, you, it's your, your match, your whatever. Go ahead. Mary, would you like to introduce yourself, and then I'll do the same and go, go ahead and go into my portion of the of the presentation. Sure. Yeah. I'm the executive director of the Health Security for New Mexicans campaign. I'm a former academic. Um, I got involved with this issue of universal health care in the early 90s um, when, when I was hired by Consumers Union, the publisher of Consumer Reports, to direct uh, their health health care project in New Mexico. And uh, so I've been working on this for, for many, many years and have been down to Las Cruces many, many times. In fact, people were saying, you better open, you know, red to open an office. <laughs> <laughs> because we have been very concerned <coughs> that, that people outside Albuquerque and Santa Fe are involved in this. And um, so what we're gonna do is Davina is going to talk about what the health security plan is, answer your questions, and then I'm going to tell you what the update is. What's 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 the next phase? What we're doing now, which is very exciting. Okay, Davina. Awesome. Thank you, Mary. And thanks for so much for having us today. We really appreciate the opportunity to join you. I actually got to spoke speak with you all. I think it was around the end of 2019 before the pandemic hit. Um, but I'm a, a pharmacist. I work here at um, in Las Cruces. I'm actually at Memorial Medical Center, and then I'm also at the Family Medicine Center. So my role as a pharmacist is both um, on the inpatient hospital side, but I also, as a pharmacist clinician in our clinic, I actually get to see people and um, help care for people with chronic conditions like diabetes, hypertension, and others. And so I also get to see our healthcare system from the prescribing side as well. So I um, got involved in the health security campaign a few years ago now, um, but it was largely driven from both personal and professional experiences with our healthcare system um, that drives my passion to develop a better system. So of course, I think starting with just a couple points about the why are we talking about this? I'd like to start with that. Um, I'm sure we all have reasons and experiences with the system that we would like to see improved, but just looking at the big picture, we know that the US spends far more than any other country in the world on healthcare, but unfortunately our health outcomes are not superior. In fact, they're much um, worse than many countries. And um, just looking at here in New Mexico, um, of course, the Affordable Care Act helped to expand the number of people who have some type of coverage. Um, but even in New Mexico, about one out of 10 um, New Mexicans under the age of 65 are still uninsured. And the COVID-19 pandemic um, definitely brought to question um, the um, utility of our largely employer-sponsored healthcare, um, healthcare system because uh, as many millions of Americans lost work, they also lost health coverage. And I think the problem also extends not just those who have covered or don't have coverage, but also in those that do, because we're seeing the cost of coverage escalate from our premiums, co-payments, deductibles. The cost of prescription drugs is simply outrageous. Um, so we need to do something, find a better system that ensures that all have coverage while doing it at a more cost-effective way. Um, so that's just a quick little introduction. I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides and go through what the health security plan is. But before I do, I just wanna get a show of hands if you don't mind either just physically raising your hand or click the raise hand function on Zoom if you have heard of the health security plan before. I believe probably most on here have, excellent. And um, we'll make sure to answer your questions, but just so that we meet your expectations while I get started, if, if there's something specific you wanna get out of this presentation today, you can go ahead and enter that in the chat so we can try to address it um, today and if not uh, later. So let me go ahead and share my slides. So I'm going to start by just going a quick refresher on what the New Mexico um, Health Security Plan is. 
uh, and the, the key components of it. And then Mary will go into what our current status is and what the next steps are. So we know that um, eventually with passage of the New Mexico Health Security Act, um, this will allow New Mexico to set up its own health plan to make certain that all state New Mexicans have comprehensive health care coverage. Um, the, a big question comes up, well, what about um, private insurance? So the health security plan, a big important point is that this is actually a system change, a major system change that would switch the role of private insurance to a secondary role. And private insurers would be able to offer um, supplemental policies just as they do in many other nations that offer universal um, health care. Um, so. So what the health security plan will do is that it will provide um, comprehensive benefits, um, quality services, and the benefits package is actually specified in the, in the legislation to be no less than what is currently offered by to our state employees, which are very comprehensive benefits. Um, the health security plan, of course, would fully protect those with pre-existing conditions. Um, very important, the health security plan would offer freedom of choice of healthcare providers. This means that it would eliminate networks. Um, so you get to choose who you go see and it's not determined by the network specified by your insurance company. Um, the health security plan will also um, set premiums that are actually based on income with caps. And so instead of premiums be, being um, developed based on age, or medical conditions, it's uh, a more fair system based on income with caps. And the system, it, there are several cost control mechanisms that are built into the health security plan, such as the bulk purchasing of pharmaceutical drugs and durable medical equipment and supplies. So who would be covered under the New Mexico health security plan? Um, the simple answer is almost all New Mexico residents um, there are three groups which would continue their current federal plans, and these include federal retirees, um, active duty and retired military, and TRICARE recipients. And there are two specific groups that um, can opt to join the plan. Um, these include our Native American tribes as, as sovereign nations um, can opt to join the plan. And then also um, self-insured companies, for example, like L, um, Intel, could opt to join the plan. Um, just a quick word about Medicare, and I'm sure there might be a, a few more questions about Medicare, um, but just want to hit on some of the key points. In, in order for the Medicare or Medicare recipients to be included in the plan, um, agreements will need to be reached with the federal government um, in order to safeguard seniors' rights. And so um, Negotiations um, will also need to be undertaken regarding Medicare supplements. So whether the supplements came from a former employee or they're purchased and ind individually um, so that retirees don't lose any of the benefits that they're entitled to. So this is one of the main details that are still really um, needed to be worked out in this design phase. And um, for these reasons, uh, Medicare recipients might not be included in the plan right away, um, but the intention is as long as we can get the waiver and protect seniors' rights that Medicare recipients would be included. Okay. Oops. Um, so who would run the plan? Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, so the, the plan would be ran by an independent non-governmental commission um, that's geographically representative of the state of New Mexico. And also uh, the, the commissioners would need to evenly represent consumer and employer interests, as well as healthcare provider and facility interests. And these commissioners, um, uh, a, a very important point is that the commissioners would have to be enrolled in the plans themselves. And so um, unlike uh, administrators of other insurance plans, for example, Medicaid, you know, the administrators may not actually be recipients of the plan. Uh, the commissioners who run the health security plan would be recipients of the plan, having that more invested interest or vested interest. And also very importantly, and Mary mentioned this in her opening comments, is that the plan is 
consistently been concerned that all areas of the state equally re represent it. And so um, since it's geographically representative of the state, actually the majority of the commissioners would come from outside of Albuquerque and Santa Fe. Importantly, all the meetings ran, um, done by the commission are subject, would be subject to the Open Meetings Act and its budget and um, uh, actions all available for pu public scrutiny. So the public really does have input. I think this is also different than how decisions are made within our current system. For example, um, insurers often make decisions about what's covered on the formulary um, that is not transparent or open to public input. Um, so this plan would be. How would the plan be paid? Um, so uh, it would come from a, a variety of different places. Um, so we would uh, use existing public dollars, um, for example, the federal and state monies um, that, come, uh, that come from Medicaid, Medicare, for example. Um, premiums, so um, individual members uh, would have premiums, but again, it's based on income with caps and some may not even need to pay into it. Uh, there would also be employer contributions and, and similarly, the employer contributions are based on payroll and number of employees with caps. Um, so a, a smaller business that has um, uh, you know, a lower salary, for example, would pay less into it than uh, maybe a larger firm or a firm that has um, a higher payroll. And then also, of course, using those existing um, federal premium subsidies and tax credits. So in a quick summary of how this plan would benefit you, um, it would guarantee your choice of healthcare providers, including across state lines. So no more networks, no more required referrals. You really have the choice where choice matters. It has an excellent set of healthcare services um, that are at least as comprehensive as our state employees. It provides affordable coverage. And I'm gonna talk about what our recent fiscal analysis found about the plan um, with premium based on incomes with caps. And also very importantly, this plan would stay with you if you change jobs, if you know, in COVID, if you uh, are laid off, you know, your coverage stays with you. Um, ensuring really that true health security. The health security plan also, as we mentioned earlier, protects those with pre-existing conditions. It does away with surprise billing, which of course has been um, fortunately making the news more about um, really how tra tragic this can be. Um, it also, it preserves our private delivery system. So it preserves the private doctors, hospitals, et cetera. Um, it reduces the overhead cost because it greatly simplifies the system and reduces the administrative burden for healthcare providers and facilities. Um, and then it will provide a stable source of revenue for hospitals and clinics through global budgets. And all across the country in New Mexico, we're seeing many of our rural hospitals, for example, at great risk of closing and many have. Um, this would help to stabilize that revenue fl flow for our rural hospitals, especially um, through the use of global budgets, which we can talk a bit more about if you would like. So uh, many of you may know that a uh, fiscal analysis was completed. The report came out in 2020. Um, it was conducted by a firm, um, uh, KNG Health Consulting out of Maryland. And the, the big takeaways I wanted to share with you from this fiscal analysis are that as, as our goal is working to achieve the health security plan would lead to universal coverage. We also know that the HSP would cost significantly less than our current system. Um, so it looked at, it compared four different scenarios um, of the health security plan compared to our current system. And between the years of 2024 and 2028, um, depending on the scenario, the health security plan is estimated to save the state of New Mexico anywhere from 1.6 um, to $2.7 billion in this five-year period. So it leads to universal coverage with significant um, cost savings. 
and really is going to help to control rising healthcare costs. We know that no matter what, healthcare costs are going to continue to increase. What we want to do is we want to try to change that trajectory and slow that rising healthcare costs. Um, in some of the scenarios that they looked at, the health security plan would be um, could be funded through existing um, fund, or existing dollars that are available. Um, in other cases, um, there may be a funding shortfall, which we would have to figure out. But a key point is that actually one of the scenarios showed a funding surplus. Um, so these were some of the key takeaways of our of the fiscal analysis that was uh, uh, released last year. Um, for those of you who don't know the website, I just wanted to provide this information. Um, I can use, even include it or copy it into the chat so that you can save it. Um, but you can go to our website for, for more questions as well. So I'm going to stop sharing and give you the chance to ask um, some questions about the health security plan and also just open it up to Mary to add anything that, um, of, uh, anything that I might have missed regarding the details of the plan. Yeah, I, I, I've traveled a fair amount in the world and I've spent a fair amount of time in Western Europe and uh, they have universal health coverage, but the private uh, also are available. If you want a higher level of coverage, it, uh, you can get it. And so the idea that you can't get, uh, you know, more coverage is just not true. And, and it works very well. Anyone else have a question, comment? Uh, yeah, Paul, um, this is probably a question for Mary. Uh, I think she said that uh, Consumers Union is involved in this, and I'm curious to know the connection. Oh, no, this was um, Consumers Union um, has different advocacy offices in Texas and in uh, New York and in uh, California. And in 1992, they wanted to open, the Texas office wanted to open up one in New Mexico. And so they hired me to direct that program. And I was involved in, at the time there were hospital sales and conversions, nonprofit hospitals were selling to for-profit. So, you know, you, you, there, there was complexities there to make sure taxpayers got, uh, weren't screwed. And um, then there was, uh, we were talking about managed care at the time. So I was involved with uh, protections, patient protections, and, um, and we started to work with a coalition that, um, that said, you know, and many states were looking at this, um, that we've got to deal with um, the systemic problems of our situation. We have the highest rate of uninsured in New Mexico. And that's the origin of the Health Security Act. And, but I only worked for them for 10 years because it got a new president who didn't want to do these local projects like in New Mexico. So I, it was 10 years that I, I worked with them and I'm still very much in touch with them. They have a lot of expertise that is important and I adore them and uh, understand the, the politics of the new president, so. <laughs> is, is any other states doing something similar to what uh, you're doing in New Mexico? There are, there are quite a few states that have developed legislation and I, and I wouldn't say states, there are organizations, coalitions like ours uh -huh. that have developed um, legislation. Uh, in New York state, um, they had a sponsor and it got through the assembly, but didn't get through the Senate uh, several times. And the same thing with California Although in California, a couple of times it actually got through their legislature, but Arnold Schwarzenegger vetoed it. <laughs> so what uh, you know? So um, I've looked at all the bill, many of the bills that um, have been produced um, in California or Wisconsin or elsewhere, and I think we really have the best piece of legislation for us. I mean, one thing is, you know, 10% of our population is Native American. They're sovereign nations. And I can't tell you that in California and, and in Minnesota and in, C in Washington and Oregon, there are Native Americans. Do you think those groups have ever talked to them? 
we have the All Pueblo Council of Governors that endorsed this two years ago, and we're now approaching the Navajo. It's very exciting. Okay. It looks Anyone like else have, have a question? Dave has his hand up. Yeah, David. I had two really, and it relates to, to funding. I have some other ones, but you mentioned that, for example, for Medicare and, and some of the other TRICARE, there is a requirement to get agreement with the federal government. Two issues, is that agreement, for example, from Social Security, not via Congress, for the, for example, a Medicare component? And the other is how stable might that agreement be? I'm concerned because there have been efforts to, for example, you know, uh, uh, get rid of the ACA. And if, if we adopt a program contingent on some Medicare funding and boom, you know, some other unfriendly president or Congress comes in, do we lose that and then we're back to square one? Do you want me to answer that, Davina? Go ahead, Mary, and then I'll, I, I, I might have a little bit to add to it, but go ahead. Oh, well, if you want to start. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, federal programs are complicated. Medicaid, for instance, uh, would be through the Center for uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services and a waiver. You'd get a specific waiver. Um, and those are state-run programs. So, um, and uh, in any kind of waiver, uh, there's usually a time limit, um, but the, what's the House Security Act says that any agreement, uh, any federal agreement must assure that, um, that the state receives all the funding and won't, won't lose any funding. Now, if Congress changes that, right, we can't control that. But as part of the uh, revenue source, we count on the same, we don't want to lose Medicaid dollars. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. And um, the Medicare, on the other hand, doesn't have a waiver program. So it's a, it's, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's nobody, no state could ever take away your Medicare. <laughs> the question is, how would it work? Is it possible for this plan to be deemed a Medicare Advantage program, but with the caveat that you have freedom of choice of hospital and doctor. You do not have that in if you sign up for the Presbyterian Medicare Advantage program and you need a cardiologist and you don't like that cardiologist or the, the, their, the ones they have, you will have to pay to go out of network. And so, um, so this there. So we don't know um, whether this is possible. And this this is going to get into our next phase that I'll be talking about is the is the issues of uh, federal constraints. And um, and then uh, with um, there there with other federal programs like we have uh, in the Health Security Act. There's an exclusion of military, military retirees, um, that would be very complex for a state to take over. <laughs> and they do have health care. So anybody who is excluded has health care. That's I think so it's universal health care. The question is who can be covered under the health security plan and who will retain coverage elsewhere. But but federal agreements um, are always contingent on time. And, um, and uh, so um, that's uh, right now we have a, um, uh, a secretary of health and human services, Javier Becerra from, from California, who will be very sympathetic uh, to this. And, um, and so uh, our philosophy is that if we get this going and just like in Canada, the Saskatchewan, it caught fire. And if other states, you know, ours is smothered in green and red chili. So Texas, smothered in barbecue sauce, whatever. Boston, in Massachusetts, big beans. But, but to have, um, if, if other states start saying, wow, New Mexico is doing this and how fascinating, we can do it. And we can do it because there is a section 1332 in the Affordable Care Act called the Waiver for State Innovation which by the way, our coalition was instrumental in getting that language in that ACA. We pushed Bingham in hard because we said an exchange may not work in our state. 
We're a poor state. Most people will be eligible for, medic, for, the, for Medicaid and Medicaid expansion and not the exchange. And is the question of viability. And you don't want the ACA to explode because exchanges are not viable in rural and poor states. So the waiver for state evasion allows the state to do something like what we're doing or other things and get, still get all the federal dollars. That's okay. the, Thank that, you. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, why don't you go ahead, Mary, and make your presentation? Oh, except that, did you have another question that's related or it's to the future? Well, the other I was just, just trying to make sure we cover what you're going to say. Okay. <laughs> we have so Dave, time. Yeah, Dave, did you have another question on? Uh, well, it, again, it, it relates to a federal issue in the sense of some people in Las Cruces, for example, work in El Paso, their employer is out of state. Is that covered in some way? The Health Security Act, do you want to answer that about the residency requirement, Davina? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, the health security, the legislation specif um, talks about um, residency requirements um, to uh, be enrolled in the plan. Um, so there, you have to show that proof of residency. And also of note, it was intentional that it was specified as residents um, instead of citizens. Um, but uh, so if someone does live in the state of New Mexico and works in El Paso as a resident of the state of New Mexico, they could qualify, correct, Mary? Yes, and it's the opposite too. If, you, if I live in El Paso and I work in New Mexico, there's a provision in the bill that allows it because there are a lot of New Mexicans, not New Mexicans, people in Colorado that actually work in New Mexico, surprisingly enough. And I know in El Paso, that's the same case. So uh, that, that's the act that provides that, okay? That, that allows for that. So the act is a well thought out um, guideline for what, um, what our own health plan would look like who could be covered under it, its coverage, how it will be paid for, and how it's going to be administered through an, uh, like a co-op, a geographically representative co-op board. But the act uh, doesn't answer a lot of specific questions, like how much will doctors really be paid? If you have a budget system for hospitals, what, how much are we talking about? And so the challenge that KNG, the, the consultant had, is they had to do what ifs. They had to do projections about what they thought these costs would look like. And so, um, that, so the, the issue is to finally answer the questions. We've had three studies in New Mexico, one in 94, one in 2007, and this recent one all of which come to the same conclusion. If you do an old fashioned risk pool and the first study in 94 include, included all the seniors, everybody, the, the tribes, the 2007 one um, did not include the over 65 population. And this recent one um, um, and, and also excluded the over 65 population. But, and even so, looking at overall healthcare costs, whether it's the cost of the plan, and you include it in the costs of everybody else who's not in the plan, you see a dramatic difference in the rate of increase of rising healthcare costs. And that's, savings doesn't mean that health costs go down, it's the rate of increase. And so the sponsors of our bill, Representative um, Debbie Armstrong, and Senator Jerry Ortiz of Pino, both of them are chairs of the health committees in the House and the Senate. They're, they're very well respected. They said, you know, it's time we moved forward. It's time to actually really roll up our sleeves and figure out how this really is gonna work. And we spent quite a few months, a bunch of us with them in the fall saying, you know, and, and uh, Debbie Armstrong called it the health security planning and design process. So when, so we have to distinguish that from the act. The act is like your recipe. <laughs> and now the planning and design problem process is you're the cooks. And maybe you need to add different ingredients, you know, than you thought. 
And um, so our concern, of course, was that the, pro the process has to be an open, transparent, and public process. And, in, and, um, and then, of course, how we're going to fund it. And uh, an economist from the Legislative Council Service estimated that over a 20-month period, it would probably cost around $600,000 to create a board that would be involved in this pro process. And De Representative Armstrong is thinking this way. She's saying, you know, let's get uh, a group of experts, people uh, uh, appointed to this board, is publicly accountable, transparent, has advisory committees, there's consultants. So that's what the $600,000 includes. And for about um, 20 months, because there's a fiscal year problem, you get them to start thinking about the design with public input. So um, clearly they're not gonna design everything in 20 months. There's a lot of issues, a lot of details to set up in what is essentially a social justice insurance plan. Um, but you know uh, things like dealing with provider payments, not just the exact amount, but the methodology, the IT system. Uh, we have uh, negotiations uh, allowed, you know, they're negotiating, they're not gonna have a say, the provider groups in this process and mediation. Well, it doesn't spell out in the Health Security Act that. So you'd have to detail that. You'd have to figure out, it's nice to talk about a global budget uh, situation that guarantees a budget to a hospital, but how is that gonna work? And we've got examples in Maryland and Pennsylvania today and there's federal dollars now to help our state actually create that. Um, how do we simplify the IT system, which is creating, is so frustrating for providers. I know that Davina can tell you horrendous stories. And, um, and in fact, the Mayo Clinic has done surveys of doctors that says that they spend three times more time looking at the computer than at the patient. And uh, so, now we have an opportunity, let's develop a, an IT system that is accountable, right? It's gonna provide the information we need, but it's simple, <laughs> it's as easy, it's not, and it's not oriented towards billing, you know, of a, for a for-profit insurance system. And uh, so these are kinds of the things that, so uh, we agreed that, you know, this is a great idea to have a board of experts and, um, and then we've, we've said, then let's set up our consumer oriented uh, commission, the commission that's going to be responsible for this plan. So the design ideas would then go to, to, to be looked at by the commission that's really responsible. And our chair, Max Bartlett says, think about an architect who designs a house and then the builders get a hold of the plans <laughs> and they say, oh, the wall's gonna fall down if you do it this way. So it's kind of a check and balance system that we were thinking about. And in a, then a question of who appoints these people and what are their qualifications? Um, and we all agree that we're very worried that there are so-called experts who can't think out of the current system box. You've got, you know, you've got to think about people um, who are willing to explore. Um, and that means, you know, looking at the way um, uh, Japan has its bulk purchasing pro program or G Germany or France, not that we'll imitate it, but what's, how do we smother it in green and red chili given the federal laws that we have to apply, you know, comply with too. So, um, so uh, what happened and, you know, we were, we, uh, the, the sponsors felt you really had to let legislative council and the governor pick um, these people. And, um, and we put in, and there was a House Bill 203 that you could see that we worked on. Uh, we have a larger white paper, but we felt, uh, the sponsors felt that the simpler, the better. Um, and it, it lays out this outline. And the most critic, one of the most critical pieces in that bill is the definition of the health security plan, because we were worried we don't want them looking at some other crazy model. <laughs> this is, let's see about this model. Can we do it in our state? Can we come up with ideas? And is there a really great public process that will unleash 
the ideas and creativity um, so that we come up with something that's very, very unique. And by the way, I recently found out that Saskatchewan, the poorest province in Canada, was the first one to do what the Canadians don't call it single payer, but their universal healthcare system. And they had a planning board. You know, they had to take years, quite a few years before they figured out what they, you know, how they were going to run it, how they were going to deal with it. And when you think about it, passing the Health Security Act, even though it says we'll all, we'll have a card, we'll have coverage, we can go to the doctor of our choice, doesn't mean that automatically once that bill is passed, I can go to the doctor of my choice and that physician is paid. You've got to have a planning period. And so that was the idea. So the, the bill was introduced in the house. We strategically, we, we, we would do that. And um, it, it really, it passed uh, very easily through Debbie's committee. And in fact, uh, one Republican turned independent, Representative Anderson actually voted for this. We had 30 people testify, actually bother through the virtual system. And that was farmers, pharmacists. I mean, it was so varied. It was really wonderful to hear. And, um, but our problem was we had an appropriation and that meant it had to go to house appropriation. And in House Appropriations, the chair is not sympathetic to us. And so we, uh, we were very worried. And uh, Senator Ortiz Pino, this was prior to the session, felt that if House Appropriations didn't put in that 600,000, when House Bill, uh, House Bill 2, which is the budget bill, goes over to the Senate, there will be a new Senate finance chair. And that then it could be put in there. Well, the new finance chair is in bed with Lundstrom from Gallup. They're both from Gallup, Senator Munoz, and also not sympathetic. So what happened was so fortuitous. It's also what happened in 2019 because uh, Representative Lundstrom was not sympathetic to a cost analysis of health security. We had a surplus of oil and gas money. And by the way, I lobby against the oil and gas industry. So it's sort of ironic that Thank you, well, I guess. <laughs> um, but they, um, so we had a surplus and it was decided that each Senator and each house member should have a certain amount of money that they could allocate to a program that they want. And uh, so, and, and uh, representative uh, um, Armstrong and I were chatting and you know, I, I told her that in putting language and in uh, what's called junior, in the, in, you know, you know 600,000 or $575,000 for the health security plan, you can't mention House Bill 203, you can't mention the bill itself, because if it doesn't pass, then you lose your money. But you can describe what it's for, and you have to give that money to an agency. And we, uh, Representative Armstrong has been in touch with the superintendent of insurance, who by the way, is a member of the Public Health Association and is a very pro-consumer superintendent of insurance. He doesn't know that much about health security, but his values are certainly in the right place. And he was very willing to be the recipient of the money that was collected. And we collected, from, thanks to uh, house members, $575,000. So to go towards the planning and design of the health security plan. This is the first time in the United States of America that a state is officially saying, we're giving money to an entity, it could have been human services, but it's fortunately it's superintendent of insurance. And he's going to be monitoring this official system. Um, um, but the problem with the language in junior is it's, you know, you don't have the bill language. And Debbie Armstrong has been talking to superintendent. He understands that he's got what he's, what the intent is to look at the language of House Bill 203. Uh, the difference is that he's the one that's going to appoint the quote experts, which is a lot better than having to, for us, all of us, to politically try and influence legislative council which consists of both houses, leaders of both parties and the governor 
to put in the right people in the, that board of expert in House Bill 203. It's much easier to work with one, you know, sympathetic, responsible entity than dealing with that complex appointment process. So I'm personally quite happy about this. We had a meeting on Friday, several of us, with Representative Armstrong and Senator Ortiz Pino about what, what are the next steps. And, uh, and Debbie has set up a meeting. The superintendent is on vacation next week. He's got a lot on his plate because there are a lot of bills that were passed um, that impact him, his office. But he, he would like to meet with us. And he specifically said with the health security plan, because I don't know much about it, um, uh, on, by May 24th, that week of May 24th. And that's very exciting. Now he has some interesting ideas. And the re what's, the Ooh, what's the matter? Oh, I've got to get <laughs> She didn't like what I said. Well, veterinarian care can be included. Okay, I promise. But you'll have freedom of choice of that. <laughs> uh, so, um, so um, you know, the reason I'm going into this is because this is an incredible process, and we're going to need all your help. One, in figuring out good people whom we think should be at this first phase. You know, who are the kinds of people that you would like to see the superintendent appoint to this committee, this first stab at design? And the second is we're going to need your help. In, once they've figured out what are the uh, issues that can be discussed in reasonable amount of time, because it's not going to, you know, it's, we're talking about a period of now it's a fiscal year because it's of, of 12 months, what can they do in 12 months? Um, and they're not gonna design everything. And we're gonna have to get more money um, in the, the 30 day session so they continue this. But, but we're gonna need your help with the input. And um, what the superintendent of insurance was concerned about, and he's right, I think, um, is we've gotta get going with this right away. This is via Debbie and her discussions with him. And he feels like we need, he wants to know what are the topics that need to be discussed and what, uh, what kinds of expert consultants are needed. And he, he's thinking that maybe not, uh, maybe to a little postpone the, not to, because if you set up the board first, that takes time. And then, you know, it's gonna take them time to figure out what the priorities are and to get the consultant. So he wants to get on that phase, that track, as soon as possible, it's interesting. And then Representative Armstrong feels strongly that we really need to know what the federal parameters are. And um, there are, um, what, what can we do given the waiver possibilities for Medicaid? What can we do if, uh, if with Medicare to assure that no, you know, everybody's rights are protected and they're not gonna lose anything? What can we do? Um, um, and, and that d d will help determine, uh, well, there's the tribes too. And, um, and you know, that determines who's in the plan. And when you know who's in the plan, that gives you a sense of costs, right? That's a, an issue of costs. Um, so, it, so she's thinking about that. We have agreed um, that prior to the superintendent of insurance uh, meeting, that we'll meet again with Debbie and um, with uh, Jerry. And um, at, in December, um, I worked on with them and, and, the, and our board uh, a paper that kind of laid out um, what the work plan would look like and what the topics would be. And so we're gonna look that over and I can send that if you're interested, you know, cause the more feedback we get, the better. Um, and to um, to and we'll go over that, and we're going to, to work out our ideas. We felt, um, and um, at the meeting, we expressed this to Debbie and Jerry, that it was really um, that yes, it's important to get the topics, but if I were the expert sitting on that board, I would want to have some say. You know, I don't. <laughs> and so you know, we feel strongly that. He's got to do both. 
He's got to, you know, start and allow for some flexibility um, so that the, that the designers, the architects have a chance to have some say um, in the, the process. There's also, I mean, the superintendent wants names of co possible consultants um, for engaging in research, which I think I'm a social scientist needs to present options, not just one, this is the answer, options so that the design board can, can uh, debate that and we, the public can debate that. So I'm giving you a lot of information. And so I wanna stop because this is, it's a very, I can tell you, it's a very exciting process. The, the board, the campaign is insisting that there be a public process. It's not just a question, gee, hire these consultants to do these topics and then we'll have a, a, a committee figure out who, putting the pieces together. No, we want public input from day one and we want transparency and we want people. And I should let you know that I, I've had discussions with in fact physici physicians who say Mary I don't know that much about setting up a bulk purchasing of drugs program um, or uh, even an IT system how what the feasibility is to you know what the techn technological stuff is uh, to simplify my life and so what we're thinking of and I uh, is offering uh, a series of zoom workshops, as, as soon as we know what, have a sense of what the issues will be that will be discussed, like hospital global budgets, that's an easy one, because we have experience in Maryland and Pennsylvania, and there are uh, other countries. And so we were thinking of having a workshop on global budgets with some expert presenters that everybody around the state could attend. And the idea is to give you enough information so that you can think, I would like to see a global budget work this way for New Mexico. We wanna give you the tools, the information so that you feel comfortable making decisions in an area that you may be interested in. There are some people that may not be interested in it. So, you know, but those who are, and it's very important to rural hospitals, we want to give whatever tools are necessary. So we want to, we're going to have a major educational process um, to do this. And uh, in addition, I'm thinking, because I'm a sociologist, of writing up a, um, a survey. Um, not that we collect the data and say, so many people think this and this, but it's, a, it's an educational survey. Because I get a lot of New Mexicans that tell me, gee, you know, I'm very supportive of health security but I'm clueless about designing this plan. And so um, I think we could develop a survey and if any of you wanna help me, that would be wonderful, is that sort of ask people, you have an experience with the insurance industry. What do you like about it? What do you dislike about it? What would you want in our own health plan? What would be, what are the three critical things that you think this health plan has to accomplish? And I think that would be very useful for people to think what area they want to get learn about and comment on. So, questions. Uh, anyway, the uh, one question I want to bring up is that uh, there's a lot of providers, and we talked earlier about the pharmaceutical industry and others that are very happy with the current system. And so, uh, uh, are the who are the critics of this plan? Basically. <laughs> Insurance. Um, we have um, eleven provider organizations that have uh, actually in endorsed this, and and that that includes uh, and the pharmacists association includes nurse practitioners, the nurses. Um, it includes um, the family, uh, the Academy of uh, Family Practice Physicians. I just got word that Hispanic Medical Society is very supportive. And, and um, I think that the physicians we've talked to are, they're so, a lot of them are so cynical about, they've never asked, you know, what they think, you know, how to design a system. And that's why we feel that the process that the superintendent insurance sets up has to be very inclusive and has to make sure to ask the impacted groups, right. you know,
What do they, but the, it is the insurance industry that hates this, even though- uh, you, I'm not as surprised. You, <laughs> as you pointed out, in, air, in all the countries that have universal coverage, there is a, a supplemental market. You can buy right. more. Right, there is. Mm -hmm. yep, and, and, and just Medicare. Medicare was, as when it was passed, there's yeah, a- Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, I have a supplemental. I'm at that age where I have Medicare. Yeah. And I have a supplemental. Yeah. And uh, uh, anybody else have a question or comment? Somebody. Charlie. Charlie, you're muted. All right. Um, yeah, I, I'm wondering, I think I have heard, but I don't remember what percentage of the uh, health care budget nationally is absorbed by the insurance companies for their management of the system. The question, of course, your, your plan is to save money. And I'm curious, what are we talking about? How much are you dealing with? Well, when you think about New Mexico, um, Presbyterian offers a hundred different types of insurance policies. That means in a doctor's office, they have to figure out, are you in Presbyterian plan A? What's covered, plan B, plan C, submitting the claims. And then the same thing for Blue Cross Blue Shield. The, the complexity, it's, it's not only the administrative costs essentially of the, the, the company and how they make their profit and the Affordable Care Act has some requirements about that, but still, it's the, the complexity of a multi-payer system and that is very, very costly. And all the, the studies that have been done in other states and the three in our, our state point this out. And you, um, there are differences in terms of what that administrative overhead looks like, but it could range from 15 to 20%. And the that's what I heard, 25% sometimes. But what, you know, the Affordable Care Act and our state requires that a certain percentage of your premium goes to, quote, health care coverage. But how those insurance companies define that, who they put in there, with, you know, is really fascinating. I mean, it's like, it's a game. But it's, a, it's part of the problem is the complexity of our system. And in our yeah. state, we just can't afford to pay all that administrative complexity um, and you know, let's simplify it, make it easier. Um, it's not a, a quote single payer system because not everybody is gonna, you, know, you can't, I don't think see how the military can be included in this, um, but they're really a small percentage of our population. And Medicare is very complicated, not only because of Medicare, but because of supplements. And if people yeah. have employer supplements, you need to protect that. You don't want an employer dumping you in to this plan and saying, uh-uh, bye. <laughs> so um, there, are, there are a lot of complexities and it's going to take about, we think three to four years to really develop the details of this plan before it's ready. It's very complicated and the insurance industry will jump with joy if we blow it. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> I'd just anyway. like to add, um, that the money that we spend um, on our, our healthcare dollars and that percentage that goes to the insurance um, company, how much of that currently stays in the state of New Mexico? Yeah. Right? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, the, the, even the employees that many of the insurance hire, I mean, they could be in any state, right? And so with this, uh, with this plan, the money that we would spend would stay within the state of New Mexico. And another thing that's specified is that the plan, I mean, they could hire a company to process claims, et cetera, but it has to be done within the state. Um, so think about that economic impact as well. So just wanted to add that. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and uh, with, I was uh, involved in the, trying to set up a public bank in uh, the uh, state of New Mexico. And the same issue is true there because all these national banks, uh, none of the money stays here. All the profit goes somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. 
It's the same principle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so how uh, do you, are you excited about this new phase for us? Does this sound well, interesting? Oh, it does. It does. I wasn't aware of the uh, extent to which it has progressed, especially at the state legislature. Uh, that's impressive. Yeah. We still have a lot of work to do and a lot of challenges. And yeah. <laughs> we'll keep you posted. Um, about you know the pro as we know the process and how you can participate in it. Yeah. No, it's very good. It's very good. And uh, it's getting close to the end of our time. Anyone else has comments, questions? I see Sarah has come on live. <laughs> she kind of keeps us in line. And uh, so, anyone else? So. Sign up for our, our um, email alert if you ha don't receive them now. Yeah, I would love to see that. But so you can uh, go on go on our website and you can yeah. just sign up. Yeah. Very and, good. And that way you get all the latest information. Yeah. Well, let's give a big hand to these two. Thank you, well, thank Davina you. and Mary. Thank you. Very good. Oh, thank you. We, I'm, I'm biting my nails. This is a, a, it's a very exciting, but you know we don't want to blow it. No, we, we don't. Want to really, we really want to do this right, and we want the right people involved, and we want New Mexicans around the state to feel like they have, they understand why this plan is so important and are supportive of it. And that's where you know if we do it right, it means that we'll have the support necessary to get additional funding that we need to, to go down to yep. continue this process. Good. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody. Oh, next week, next week, next week. <laughs> uh, we're gonna have, uh, oh yeah, uh, I'm gonna do the uh, Great Courses series. It's gonna talk about uh, manifest destiny and the extent to which it has affected us here in New Mexico. And uh, looking at uh, before, during, and after the Civil War, the extent to which we uh, put a lot of pressure on the natives of this country is just unbelievable. And so this professor will, it, it'll be a half hour where he kind of talks about what happened, and then we'll have a discussion about the consequences. <clears throat> All right, so sounds great. Point. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Hope you have a good Sunday afternoon. Take care, Bye. everybody. Bye-bye. Stay Bye. safe. <laughs>